folks to our first poster blitz. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you exactly 60 seconds, and then I'm going to usher you quickly off the stage. Would the following poster folks in, um, in alphabetical order please come up and line up against the wall over here to prepare uh, from Anderson through Smoker. So please move thyselves over this way. All right, so in recombination line observations of compact H2 regions in the inner galaxy, 30% of sight lines have two velocity components. In the middle figure there, we separated those velocity components into just the diffuse ionized gas, and it's correlated in those two velocity ranges and also with diffuse 8 micron emission. And we believe in the bottom figure that we can map significant parts of the warm ionized medium with the GBT in recombination lines. Um, so they say a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, so here's my thousand words. Um, my name's Brian Babbler, and I'm a part of the Galpha H1 team. And this um, Galpha H1 is a neutral H1 survey. And our second data release, which we're about to present, will present, will present the whole um, sky from Arecibo, Puerto Rico. And so our poster will highlight some of the uh, new stuff, some of the uh, new sensitivity that we have uh, uh, been able to find. So come and check out our poster. So my name is Dana Balser, and uh, um, the poster is basically about a new method, potential method of calculating the magnetic field strength in PDRs. The hypothesis is that the non-thermal line width of carbon radio recombination lines in PDRs is, is due to uh, MHD waves. And so we tested this by using the GBT yeah, to, the sorry, so we tested this hypothesis by uh, using the, the <laughs> we tested the hypothesis by, uh, the hypothesis <laughs> was that, that the non-thermal non line widths of, of uh, uh, carbon rate recombination lines is due to MHD waves. And therefore you can use that to calculate the magnetic field strength. So we used the GBT uh, to test the hypothesis by measuring uh, very accurate line profiles in four PDRs where we had H1 or OH Zeeman measurements. And the results are consistent with this hypothesis, although there are lots of assumptions and approximations that we made. And so we think that probably we wouldn't really be able to use this method unless we had uh, the sensitivity of SKA or NGVLA, for example. But if you're interested, I'd be interested in what people, experts here, think if this is uh, plausible or not. So thank you. Okay, so this is a very busy slide uh, showing uh, some nice results from several different surveys of uh, using CO isotopologues throughout uh, a large part of the Milky Way to, uh, among other things, uh, look at line ratios and establish a new conversion uh, from uh, CO intensity to total column density or H2 column density. Uh, so the bottom line is um, we've got a new way of doing this. There's a lot of arrows pointing in different directions on that diagram. Which is all very clear when you look at the poster, if you come by, um, and I'll be happy to explain it to you. So it's all based on uh, Thrums, Champ, and Sedigism data, uh, which is mostly published now. But come see. Hi, my name is Erin Betcher. I'm a grad student here at UW-Madison. And I'm interested in the diffuse ionized phase of extraplanar gas in disk galaxies. So here I'm presenting some results on the dig layer in NGC 891, uh, where we're asking whether there's sufficient vertical support to explain the fact that the scale height of the dig layer is a factor of a few larger than the thermal scale height. 
So we argue that the thermal and turbulent support are not sufficient to account for the scale height, but that including magnetic fields and cosmic rays in the model can achieve a scale height of about a kiloparsec. And we also address some relevant stability issues. So I'd love to chat about this with anyone if you're interested. So come on by. Thank you. Right, I have, oh, handheld mic. So good morning, my name is Joanne Dawson from Macquarie University and CSR Astronomy and Space Science. You'll hear me again tomorrow in a talk, I think. My poster is on SPLASH, a survey we've been doing in the ground state transitions of OH to attempt to get at this problem of the CO dark interstellar medium. Um, Adam gave us a nice introduction of how you try and get at that with extinction type studies or dust related stuff. We've been looking at OH as an alternative. It tends to trace uh, less dense phase of the molecular interstellar medium. Um, our survey is now complete and unfortunately not quite published and it's been setting, sitting in this not quite published state for far too long, hence it being a poster and not a talk. But if you want to come and talk to me about some of the advantages and the challenges of using the OH ground state lines to try and probe CO dark H2, um, please come and find me at my poster. And I would like to talk to you about all the brilliant future work we will be doing as soon as the data reduction is finished up and as soon as the survey is in a kind of consumable state. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Alex Hill. I, this poster is representing the GMIMS Consortium, the Global Magnetoionic Medium Survey, um, in which we have a all northern sky map of diffuse polarized emission from the Milky Way uh, from 1300 to 1800 megahertz. And the poster highlights results from two regions, the North Polar Spur and the Fan region, which are the dominant uh, features in the polarized sky. Um, the, the North Polar Spur, we have a rotation measure map, and we find that the uh, North Polar Spur, the upper part, the high latitude part, heavily has to be local, whereas the lower part might have a might be a larger scale galactic feature. And the fan region, this lower part, which has generally been thought to be very local at high frequency, really has to be a very large, many kiloparsec scale structure that is tracing uh, galactic structure, particularly from the Perseus arm. And so it comes to the poster. Good morning, my name's Jason Kirk, and with Wu Jin Kwan, I'm representing the Bistro Consortium. This is a new imaging polymetric survey of nearby star formation regions. We're following the work that was done by the JCMT Gold Belt Survey, because we've targeted our observations towards those regions that have good dust continuum measurements and uh, molecular line measurements, so we can use the combined data set to use the CF technique to estimate not just um, polarization direction and thus magnetic field direction, but also magnetic field strength within these regions. Um, we're pretty much driving the commissioning of the Pole 2 polarimeter, which is the follow-up instrument to the old SKU pole polarimeter, if those of you are aware of the JCMT's history. Okay, thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm DK, I'm a graduate student here at Madison. Um, come talk to me and I'll tell you all about the Carina arm as seen by WAM, the Wisconsin H-alpha mapper. Um, so I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of our early findings on the vertical structure of the warm ionized medium throughout the spiral arm. So come say hi. I'll be wearing a green headband. Uh, okay. Uh, for those of you who have always dreamed of more spectral line information from your source, <laughs> let me just say, be careful of what you wish for. <laughs> so uh, my poster has some uh, submillimeter ALMA observations of Orion Source I, which is the massive star at the center of the Kleinman Low Nebula. When centimeter uh, radio detections were made of this source a long time ago. It's obvious that, well, this must be a hypercompact H2 region, but as we gradually piece together the spectral energy distribution at higher frequencies, I think we're beginning to see that maybe what we see, even at centimeter wavelengths, is dust emission from this source. 
So it's not quite what we expected, and that opens up a lot of questions, which actually don't even fit on the poster. But anyway, thank you. Uh, good morning. So I'm uh, Dave Raj from Inaway, Mexico. I'm presenting a near infrared polarimetric observation of this uh, S235 molecular complex. It's a very interesting region. It has uh, some star formation going on and also expanding H2 region. So what I'm trying to understand is um, how do H2 regions affect the magnetic field? And uh, this region, you can actually see that it has a semi or shell-like structure. And uh, the red vectors are the background uh, starlight po polarization. So they basically seem to trace around the shell. And uh, the H2 regions uh, probably are affecting the magnetic field structure. And further, this region is known to have a positive feedback for triggered star formation. So we can, in, in future, investigate uh, what would, how does magnetic field affect in uh, triggered star formation. Please feel free to uh, come down near my poster. I'll be happy to discuss with you. Thank you. Who is this? Uh, Santos? Present? No? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Hi, I'm Dominique Segura Cox. I'm a fifth year graduate student at the University of Illinois, and I study the youngest protostellar disks using the Van Dam survey. Van Dam stands for the VLA Nascent Disk and Multiplicity Survey, and that is the um, study of all of the youngest class zero and class one protostars in the Perseus molecular cloud. It is the highest resolution at 12 AU resolution and most complete survey of young protostellar objects uh, to date uh, at this wavelength. And I study the young stellar object, or sorry, the young disk portion of that survey. And previous to this, there were only three known class zero protostellar disks. And now we found 12 more. So we more than tripled the number of possible class zero protostellar disks, and as well as expanding the number of known uh, possible class one disks. Uh, so uh, please stop by my poster, and I'll fill you in on the details of how we do this, as well as comparing that to the known molecular or known magnetic fields that we uh, know from literature, and trying to see if there's a connection between those two. Hello, I'm Zach Sleppy, and I just got my PhD from Harvard, and this is work done in collaboration with Doug Finkbeiner and Blakeslee Burkhart. So basically what we've been interested in is how do you quantify the spatial structure of dust? In the ISM, people have used the two-point correlation function, which measures pairs of chunks of dust you know, over some scale. People have used the power spectrum, which is the Fourier space analog, and Blakeslee did pioneering work with the bispectrum with Alex Lazarian in 2009. But what no one has done is used the correlations of triplets with the full angle dependence on the opening angle of the triangle. So you can see just sort of at the upper right there, we've got a triangle. And, you know, the side lengths matter and the opening angle matters. So with my advisor at Harvard, I developed a transformatively fast algorithm to compute the three-point correlations, which is actually a combinatorically quite challenging problem. And this allows us to analyze 512 cubed simulations of the dust in a water eight hours on one core. So we can do high throughput parameter studies of what different magnetic fields and turbulence and particular shocks look like. And eventually the hope is to compare to observational maps like the um, WISE All Sky Survey or even a 3D dust map that Doug Finkbeiner and his grad students have been developing. So uh, if this is of interest with you, I hope to have some good conversations around it. Thanks. Hello, uh, last and least, I'm Jonathan Smoker. I work at the VLT in Chile. Uh, I come from England, it's always sunny there. In the middle of, it's uh, sometimes I have bad weather at the VLT, so I had a, a program to look for diffuse interstellar bands in the near infrared. Now DIBS, there's about 400 known, um, but what we, what we did here, most of them are known in the optical, we did a survey of about 67 stars um, in the infrared bands at 1.3 microns at a resolution of, of 50,000. So we found a few, we did uh, some uh, time variability studies. We put two stars on the same slit, and we, the only results so far we have the correlation between the reddening and the dip strength at 1.3 microns. So thank you very much.
All right, extremely well done, everybody. Thank you.